Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Itzkoff. I'm a culture reporter from the New York Times, and it is my great pleasure to sit down tonight with the two men who dismantled the Marvel Universe and then put it back together, Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. Congratulations I, to both I, of you. I hope we put it back together. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so uh, people saw the movie. It's great. It's they, awesome. They apparently are con- <laughs> They apparently continue to see the movie. Yeah. yeah. A little nuts. Yeah. If, if your regularly scheduled quality viewing will resume yeah. That's right. in a couple of months. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so truly, uh, congratulations. I mean, it is a feat of storytelling, not just what you've accomplished in Endgame, but between Infinity War and Endgame across the Captain America movies. Uh, tell me a little bit about how the two of you started working together, how you met and sort of knew that you uh, wanted to write together. Well, it's a, it's a, I don't know how inspiring it is, but. <laughs> it was a met, personal ad. Yeah, it was, you know, <laughs> there we were in prison. Uh, <laughs> we were both going to UC Davis for fiction writing. Um, and it's a lovely program, but if you, if you know the program, it's very oriented on nature writing. Mm-hmm. Writing about walking through the trees, great stuff. Right. Neither of us have a particular angle on that. Right. Um, but we were writing away, he was writing a novel, I was writing a book of short stories, but it's a two year program and eventually the anxiety begins to kick in. Yeah. Which is, this is gonna end and I can't write lame little short stories for money for the rest of my life. Uh, what, you know, does this mean you have to give up writing and go get a job at Costco and, and that's it? Yeah. And then... My uncle uh, that Christmas gave me a book called How to Sell Your Story in Hollywood. Mm. And I, I didn't understand any of the words on the cover. Like it just was, I loved movies but didn't quite put together that they were written. Right. And I brought it back to Chris and I said, Look at all the words on this cover. And, and, and he went, oh, OK. And, and uh, so we, over the course of the next year and a half, we wrote two um, not very good uh, sitcoms for a fresh new uh, show called Friends. Uh-huh. That's now, now, to be clear, didn't write it for the show. No, no, just no. wrote one yeah. for ourselves. Expect ourself. scripts. And then, yes. Yeah. And right. then uh, we wrote a thriller, which uh-huh. was not thrilling. Uh, <laughs> But it, we learned valuable lessons in doing that because right. we recognized that um, uh, we got about halfway through and then we would have the detective lean over the body and say something hilarious and we go, oh, I wish he could say that. He can't say that. Yeah. Backspace, backspace, right. backspace. <laughs> and we vowed that, okay, we're going to finish this just as an exercise and then we're going to, the next one we write, we're going to leave all that stuff in because yeah. that's what we like. Were it's, you both, I mean, did you, did, you, did you aspire to write, you know, big blockbuster, epic type films, things that would be seen by, you know, billions of people worldwide? No, and to be honest, I think that's why we have continued to write that kind of movie, yeah. because we, we just, I mean, we didn't know exactly, we did not come with a, a dream of a particular film in mind. Right. So uh, we just wanted to write. It's really like we have this, we know we have this skill. Nascent how can, early in how can career we skill. Yeah. Make something out of it. Right. Now, it took a few years, but a big breakthrough for you was uh, a biographical film about the life of Peter Sellers. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, tell me about you know, how that came to be. Well, that, uh, there are many roundabouts that we won't go into prior to that, but. Uh, yeah, tell me the Hollywood version. Yeah, get of the get story. to the yeah. sex. HBO, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> there Spider-Man's I was. Spider-Man's in the front row. Take pulling it. on my pants. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> No, a, a producer named Freddie DeMann had optioned uh, a biography of Peter Sellers by the same name uh, and had set it up at HBO. And they didn't particularly have a take on it. Right. And they kind of put out a cattle call in some ways. Uh, and we got in there and managed to sell a pitch that they liked and that they then called us the next day and said, we really like that pitch. It's unbelievably expensive on a rights level. And they were very nice about it. They were like, can you come up with a completely different pitch that costs less? <laughs> in like a day. <laughs> in a day. Right. And so we sat there and 
did and went in and got the job and wrote the script. And uh, that script was actually uh, essential to where we are now. Right. Not only because it you know, was an entree into actually having movies made, which is kind of a good thing, yeah. uh, but we were at the same agency as Andrew Adamson, who had directed Shrek and Shrek 2. Right. And he had read uh, Sellers and just liked it. And we, had, we met with him, and not on any particular project. It was just like, hey, we're all here at the same place. I liked your thing. Right. Um, and then he got the gig to do Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which right. is a big, uh, epic movie with a lot of special effects in it. But they already had a draft right. that wasn't working very well because it was very close to the book, and the book is, is, doesn't differentiate the characters all that much. Right. And so they needed a character pass. They had all the effects. They had all the money to pay for you know, talking beavers and whatever else you want. <laughs> they had very skilled people ready to make giant set pieces. So they needed somebody with a small particular skill of, of, of differentiating the characters. So Andrew thought of us because he liked the characters in, in Sellers. Right. So we got onto this big movie by having a small skill right. and then just didn't fall over our own shoelaces when writing the, you know, the big <laughs> epic things. And it kind of went from there. Right. Is, is that, was that the entree into uh, writing Captain America, the first Avenger? Is that how you got that call? Uh, not exactly. That's, uh, they're related. We, um, I'm proud of this generally that people Ten, they rarely fire us, you know. So we were in Narnia for two and a half movies, and uh, but when we came out, no time had passed. That's right. right. <laughs> uh, and uh, we were on strike. Uh, if you remember this, back in 2007 and eight, the Writers Guild uh, caused trouble, as we are want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, as we were walking the picket line, I remember getting a call. It was basically. Don't come back to Narnia. We're right. moving on, uh -huh. uh, and that meant that we had 2008 to try to find another job, and that's about when, for your historians, that Iron Man came out and announced to the world that Marvel's gonna gonna call their shot. Right? We're gonna make a Thor. We're gonna make a, another Iron Man, and we're gonna make a period Captain America movie. Right. And Chris and I went, "Oh, that's that's really interesting to us because, in, just in theory, it, we thought it'd be really interesting to." to start a, a, a superhero franchise based on the time it was written. Maybe that would solve villain problems. You know, Nazis are easy. Uh, so we chased <laughs> that movie all throughout 2008 and had to convince them that the Narnia guys were the right guys, because that wasn't necessarily their first instinct. Right. And eventually we wore them down through charm. Right. <laughs> I was going to ask what, what, uh, what the secret was, but I guess. Charm. It, yes. There was <laughs> some charm. Yeah. <laughs> And availability. Right. That's, that's right. <laughs> Willingness to work cheap. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, what do you remember? Because, I mean, of course now we think about Marvel as, you know, I mean, it is synonymous right. with, you know, summer movies and, you know, uh, just, you know, blockbuster, surefire, you know, franchises and characters that are beloved. But things were a little bit different even in, you know, the yeah. 2008, 2009 era and the, even the, the success of Iron Man was no certainty and once it was I mean what was going to come next was uh, a little up in the air I mean what was what what do you remember about it uh, I remember being impressed that they had even any the slightest intention of trying to interconnect these things um, and you know Kevin had said you know maybe if we make this and we make this and we make this maybe we'll make an Avengers movie and we're like, that's cool. That's, nice. <laughs> that's right. You, you try that, Kevin. Because also, we were living in a time where, you know, I think Harry Potter was probably mid-run at yeah. that point. But there were a lot of people trying to launch franchises. And you would see the first movie in an expected four-part franchise tank, and you never get any closure. And, and it was happening a lot. And... So anytime anybody said, we're going to do this, you'd go like, I bet you are, yeah. you know. <laughs> I, but as we got to know the people behind it and got to know Kevin and, and the other people at Marvel, you know, there is a real care and a real skill 
to what they're doing that I've never seen anywhere else. Yeah. We weren't so, necessarily sure they were going to be able to accomplish it, but we knew that their intent was right. spot on. Spot on, I mean. and they and I will say the one thing that made a huge difference in in conceiving it because also superhero movies had been in a little bit of transition and like the X-Men had come out and they were all in uh, like black leather. Yeah. And one of the triumphs of Iron Man was he looked like Iron Man. Yeah. You know, that suit was amazing and the effects were amazing and it it was a it there's a real penny drop where you go, okay, we can make Make Pretty metal. much yeah. Marvel Comics now. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, I remember being a real small shop. Do you remember like it was above a car dealership in the, yeah. like yeah. the Playboy building? It was just sort of a weird thing. Like, and there was only four people that worked there. I mean, it was really. It, but I mean, we were, and but we were going for Captain America, who is, you know, in the abstract, one of the sillier looking people right. they have access to. Yeah, the, the wings on the... And, you know, we were kind of going like, well, we, we like the concept and the period concept, but that costume, like, yeah. I'm not 100%. And Ryan Meyerding, who is the concept artist who has been with them the entire time and has basically largely been behind the look of the MCU, yeah. had done a, a drawing of what a cool Captain America would look like. Right. And it was, it, suddenly the whole, you could see the whole movie in front of you, you go like, oh my God, you're, yeah. gonna, you're gonna make this movie and it's gonna be good. Yeah. And we want in. Right, right. Tell me, I, I mean, imagine at some point in this process, uh, you know, on the first movie, of course, you must have met Chris Evans, yeah. who of course has become, I mean, essentially the quarterback of this team. And, yeah. But maybe not a guy you would have thought at the time or based on past work would no. know that he would blossom into the, the actor and the, the person that he's become. What were your... Mm. What, he, well, he notoriously has been reluctant about being uh, so much in the limelight and, and, and being so popular. He's, yeah. he's a bit, has a bit more anxiety than perhaps some of your other uh, leading men. Yeah. Um, what I always thought about him that was, I don't even know if, Marvel understood this, maybe Kevin did, is that, you know, his previous roles were sort of smart aleck, you know, this is a wise ass guy, uh, and was always funny, and, and that's not Cap, and, but you somehow feel that, like you feel that there's a hidden depth he's not giving you. So I always find myself leaning into his performances, wanting more out of him, that the character is sort of not giving me, and I think there's a magnetism that comes that, that he has understood over the course of his, you know, 10 year run. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in some ways it seemed like the too easy casting, like he'd already played superheroes. He's right. a big, handsome guy. And it was almost like I would go down the expected route, but he's just so damn perfect for it yeah. that, I mean, right after we started working, it was like, oh, well, you know. Yeah. And obviously, you know, I, everyone understands this probably like, Casting is is half the reason the Marvel Cinematic Universe works, yeah. right? Like, I mean, if it was not Downey, would we be here? Yeah. You know, Evans, I think it rivals Downey as as perfect marriage with character and guy. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, was it was it a built-in certainty that you know, I mean, after uh, 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 the first Avenger was a success, that you were also then going to write the next two? It was uh, no successes in quotes, Dave. Right. I mean, like that's their one of their lowest grocers, for sure. Like really? it's a yeah. I yeah. Mean, it. it it's, it yeah. ended up at probably something like in the threes. Endgame's first weekend. Oh, wow. first um, day yeah. in <laughs> one country. Yeah, no, it's the craft uh, services. And, uh, wow. But, you know, it was a common, it worked. Yeah. And I think everybody was pretty happy with the movie and happy with the experience we'd all had working together. Yeah. Um, but there was, you know, Okay, we'd pulled off a period Captain America. We'd written right. period, whatever that means. Yeah. Uh, but the next one had to be in the modern day. And so there was, you know, I assume somebody went, are these the guys to write the modern day ones or are they just the period guys? They wrote three period Narnia movies and now they wrote a little Captain America movie and it's like maybe they live in the 40s. Right. Um, <laughs> maybe they wear fedoras. That's yeah, right. exactly. And so, <laughs> look, would you rather look at my head? Uh, there's a lot of it. Uh, the... And so there was kind of like, I was really glad when we got the job of Winter Soldier and got a draft in of Winter Soldier yeah. and it took yeah. place in the present day and it was, you know, 
But it was not a, it wasn't a slam dunk they make it, right? There was, yeah. there's, it, there's hiring us to write a, a hypothetical draft oh. in the big picture, not that expensive. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it's a little different than pulling a green light. So when that script came in and it was, um, uh, you know, it was basically a 70s paranoid conspiracy movie. Yeah. Uh, they were pretty happy with it and then went out and got these, you know, TV directors. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Did you know, I mean, you couldn't have known at that stage, I mean, the intricate, the sort of, the intertwined careers and the time that you it's, would spend with, with Joe and Anthony it's, Russo. It's totally weird. It still yeah. comes as a shock. Yeah. That's right. I mean, it is very strange. Like, we have made four movies together in a row. It's, yeah. yeah. We should be on each other's nerves yeah. by now. <laughs> um, but it has worked out, we've... We interlock yeah. very well. Yeah. Clearly, clearly. I mean, fast forward a little bit. I mean, you've made you know you've made the two camp sequels. You've created uh, a TV show for Agent Carter that should have gotten many, many more episodes. Than oh, it I did. agree. Yeah. Now, at, at what point does uh, Marvel come to you and say, "Hey, we've got this idea where you guys are not going to write"? one movie, but you're gonna write two movies that are gonna be interconnected and basically involve every single character we've got and every they, actor we've They got. basically came to us while we were doing Agent Carter and prepping and still finishing the script for Civil War. Right. <laughs> and my primary reaction was, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm very tired and that sounds like so much work. Uh, yeah. But it was also an opportunity that clearly was never, ever going to happen again. It's two parts. It's the biggest puzzle that we would ever face. Yeah. That I, I, I dare say very few screenwriters have had the opportunity to, to, to try to write this complicated a narrative. Yeah. So, you know, do what scares you. So, it, you know, we yeah. tried. I mean, where could you even look for sort of reference or guidance or, it's a or good yardstick. question. There yeah. wasn't a lot. You know, we, we often look to other movies just for, so we're all talking the same language. So mm -hmm. We usually can't talk about it until the movie comes up, but like Three Days of the Condor, we talked about a lot for Winter Soldier, right? Sure. And uh, Civil War, strangely, we talked about Seven a lot for a, a villain that works in the background while it looks like something else is going on. Yeah. And boy, for these two movies, there wasn't that much that that we really sort of honed in on. It's right. a mad, 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 mad one. Which is <laughs> dear to my heart. Right. It's Large a joke. Gas, yeah. Long yeah. Um, the infinity stones are buried underneath a giant that's, that's tea. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Hemsworth is essentially Phil Silver's. Right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, <laughs> now you've just got me thinking of references to that movie. Well, but I mean, you'll notice that those mo these movies uh, operate a little differently than traditional movies. Like yeah. if you don't know, I mean, I, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but if you don't know the previous movies going in, I can't imagine what you think of these. Like we don't hold your hand that much. Yeah. Mm. We assume in order, because we have a lot of work to do in these movies yeah. and we can't do previously on the Marvel Universe. Right. I, I mean, it'll be 45 minutes. <laughs> so, you know, Infinity War starts with a big, purple guy choking Thor and you know it and we are off to the races yeah uh, that's all we can do did you know I mean uh, the original Avengers I mean that was not your film but did you even know at that stage that that Thanos was going to become you know so important to mm. your to our lives yes no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean I will be honest I saw him at the little end tag to Avengers and I was like ah, I think I know who that is yeah um, <laughs> Which is, you know, also a testament to, to Kevin and the people at Marvel who... Yeah. Have educated a populace. Well, yeah, they don't necessarily... <laughs> these things don't need... I mean, they're obviously pre-sold to comic book fans, but there are only so many. Yeah. Uh, but they're confident in their ability to make, it, to make these things, and they're confident in the inherent charm and, and well-constructedness of the characters that that they can make a movie about a thing you have not heard of in the right. slightest yeah. and get you to love it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's to your credit as well. I mean, the, ver you know, there, the version of Thanos that you have created in particular and what motivates him and, mm. you know, obviously a guy with awful, awful ideas and yet you... Are they? Are they, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> I've been driving around this city. <laughs> 
<laughs> Awful lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the subway would be a little bit more comfortable, but, yeah. but otherwise. Right. Walked through Italy yeah. yesterday. <laughs> Very crowded. <laughs> like half of those people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, the room at the sandwich right. spot. <laughs> <laughs> but you found a version of him that is, you know, compelling and cinematic, and that's really fascinating. Well, we made him the hero of his story. Yeah. Uh, that was, again, I, I, you know, you can give credit to us, but, like, Marvel lets us do this. Like, they say, we're going to spend a ton of money, and the bad guy's going to win. And we, and so, we, oh, okay. Yeah. And so we figure out that if we make him, and we have 23 characters. Yeah. Crazy. So the only way to get that done is to decide, and took us a while to figure it out, that it's Thanos' story. He's the hero of basically a Campbell myth hero's journey. Yeah. And the Avengers are trying to stop him. They're the antagonists. They're yeah. the, the obstacles. So and they're basically minor characters in that. Kind of, yeah. That's, you know, so they're all, it's egalitarian in that way in that you know, nobody has you know, too big an arc except for Thanos. Yeah. I say this before, like, Thanos, at the end of Act Two, Gamora dies. Um, and usually at the end of Act Two, that's the worst thing that can happen in the movie, it's the darkest moment. And that is true for Infinity War. Yeah. But it is not the darkest moment for the Avengers. Yeah. It's the darkest moment for Thanos. Because he has to make this ultimate sacrifice. Do I, am I gonna talk the talk about all I've been saying and doing? Yeah. And is it gonna cost me um, kind of the only person he loves? Yeah. But it's also great to write about a villain who's not, I mean, write for a villain who's A, doesn't see himself as the villain, mm -hmm. and B, has, however you feel about them, pretty well reasoned out uh, philosophy for what he's doing. Yeah. Um, so, and he's very bright and not, he's, you know, he's not an asshole, if I can, <laughs> if I can swear in the 90 seconds why. Uh, he has interesting fashion tastes, as we learn. Though. He does. He yeah. was, oh, you mean in the beginning? He's wearing a <laughs> t-shirt. <laughs> Well, and also, I mean, the thing, we didn't invent this, but he has two adopted daughters, yeah. which automatically makes him a more interesting villain than most, yeah. because, like, the Joker doesn't have, you know, he's not paying alimony to right. the ex-wife. Right. Like, <laughs> like, there's something inside this person that's motivating him to do things that villains don't traditionally do. Right. So, And then you get Josh Brolin, who yeah. just right. crushes it. Absolutely. I mean, tell me, I'm sure this is a question you must get so often, but just the task or the challenge of, you know, writing basically two, you know, interwoven screenplays. Right. And, you know, it was not a situation where you write one, it gets filmed, you write the next one. I mean, you're writing it in its entirety. You basically have to have the entire trajectory of both these films yeah. figured out. I mean, you know, I know it's easier said than done, but how, how do you do it? It, it appeals, I mean, it appeals to a little bit of my OCD, right? <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, it's the last four months of 2015, and this we have the, the big wall, right? And there's one movie, two movies, and, yeah. and uh, the puzzle of it, the structure of it, is exciting even though it's re it was quite difficult and a lot of headbanging, you know, in order to, uh, and we always, you know, we forget how to write all the time, and we forget yeah. how to structure all the time, and we have to remember, oh, this is a very obvious idea. We should have had it a month ago. Yeah. Like, it just happens constantly. And as, as long as we're, you know, confessing our mental disorders, it appeals to my ADD. Uh. Because <laughs> I can, you know, can look at a movie one and get stuck on something, and then go, like, can we just talk about <laughs> movie two over here? Is this part, I know what's happening in, right. you know. So you could actually kind of jump in and out of each film. And for yeah. sure, we uh, knew the end of Endgame as we were, you know, uh, as we were planning everything. We planned them both together, outlined right. them together, and then simply because we only have two hands a piece, we would write, you know, we wrote one and then wrote the other and then revised and revised. And we turned them in in back-to-back -back weeks right. uh, in like late May of 16, yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, I guess, you know, we're probably going to start bumping up into, you know, spoiler territory, but I think one thing we can, I, I assume, safely talk about is, I mean, of course, you know, Infinity War ending with the snap, everybody knows that, yeah. uh, and that, the placement of that, I mean, that, you know, obviously that's, that's your dividing line, but that maybe could have gone elsewhere, could have, been, could have shifted a little bit, or even it, where the break would occur. It could have, but there would have been, you would have lost something. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you did it earlier in Infinity War, the scenes after it would have just, just been, <laughs> I don't know what, like a, like a vestigial limb just yeah. flapping. <laughs> like, you can't top it and you can't talk about it yeah. even. 
Um, and if we held it to the next move. He's got five stones, come back next Is round. he going to do it? <laughs> like, what we want, I mean, the whole second movie is predicated on the fact that he did it, yeah. and you are going to live with that, and you are going to suffer because of it. Yeah. You being the Avengers. Uh, and we just wanted to say definitively, oh no, he won. Yeah. And again, it was his movie, and that's the end of his movie. And Marvel's, that's the thing, Marvel's not afraid of that. Right. Like that's, I can see other studios go, maybe we should have a little hope. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like uh, we put Luke's hand back together. Right. We're <laughs> heading off to find him. We, we <laughs> Nothing. gave them a yeah. beeper. We gave him a beeper. Right. Uh, that's true. That's, that's right. true. But we made you sit through eight minutes of credits before yeah. you got it. Yeah. And we killed Nick Fury. And yeah. then we killed Nick Fury. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and ninety percent of the people didn't even know what the beeper was. For you know? sure, for sure. But they clapped anyway. Right. But they were <laughs> Beepers! Right. It's this, Superman! This summer, you will clap for a beeper. <laughs> what was it like for you? I mean, after Infinity War had come out, and you know, the audience is basically left, uh, you know, I mean, Crushed. As, yeah, yeah, we spent as viewers about a year just kind of wallowing in that belief that, I mean, yeah. you know, on some level we know they're coming back, but we just saw half of them get wiped out. And yeah. you know, as writers, you, I mean, you know what's coming next, right. but how did it feel to kind of see that wash over the, the I, viewers? I've of the had film? far better movie going experiences on this movie. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> because the last movie, I would, you know, I sneak into theaters and, yeah. and, uh, you know, at the end of the movie, I can't hear anything. Because yeah, no everyone's cheer. just sort of catatonic, or maybe they're sniffling, and there's nothing. Yeah. But when I sneak into movie theaters now, there's just like, there's, there are roars and yeah. cheers and some sniffling, and it's, it's, yeah. it, that is much more satisfying. But it was, I mean, it, it was pretty incredible to see the emotional response to, to the snap. I mean, yeah. we have... We've lived with all the things that happen in these movies for four and a half, five years. Yeah. The emotional impact on us is somewhat deadened after, you know. We're dead inside. 15 <laughs> drafts. <laughs> and you've seen 40 takes of someone die, and it's like, right. I'm really over you dying. <laughs> <laughs> but to see people crying and shocked and, and not sure what to do with themselves, okay. you know. Uh, is is it doesn't give you a sense of power, but it <laughs> gives you a sense of like responsibility. Well, responsibility, but also people are very <laughs> dialed into what we are doing. Yeah, right. and it made me very happy that we had Endgame coming yeah. because yeah. I know it's the right antidote yeah. to what they just experienced. And it's well said, absolutely. And and I mean the the total. Uh, shooting time on both films back to back was what, like 200 days? It yeah, is, something uh, like that. Yeah, we, uh, was a year. Yeah, we wow. moved to Atlanta in the middle of off. 2016 and then shot all of 2017 and then another month here and there. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, you, I mean, of course, the, you know, you're not the directors of the film, but you are still there every single day. <laughs> yeah. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> are, were there, you know, I mean, again, you know, with, with respect for people who may not have seen the film yet, but were there ever problems that you were called on to solve? Sure. It, it, oh, yeah, all, yeah. All the time. Yeah, it's, uh, again, more than most movies. Um, yeah. You know, Chris and I know, forgive the pun, where the bodies are buried, right? right? <laughs> uh, so, and it's so complicated in some ways, and you're doing two at the same time, and sometimes you're doing movie one on a, on movie two on a Tuesday and movie one on a Wednesday, and, oh. and so it was job security. <laughs> Because, you know, right. when are you going to fire us? Who are you going to get? Like, we're the only ones that know what's happening here. Right? I know you. <laughs> um, but also, uh, uh, you know, it was sort of a living, breathing thing in many ways. I remember mm -hmm. specifically there's a, there's a scene in Infinity War where... Um, Get a little nerdy. So Ebony Maw has Doctor Strange right where he wants him, and he's torturing him with these needles that are, you know, initially uh, used for microsurgery. Uh, and uh, Tony and Peter and Doctor Strange's cloak are way up here, and they're spying on him and trying to figure out how are we going to save him. Well, we saved him in a completely different way oh. that didn't work, and it was really long, and it was complicated, and it slowed the movie down. And so. 
we still had that set up and we still had those actors. And so there's a lot of us in the editing room going, oh, this isn't that good. All right, let's go back to the drawing board, call them in on Wednesday, we're gonna do this again. Wow. And, and sort of a simpler version. In that case, an homage to the swordsman scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, where you could have an entire sword right. fight, or you could just shoot them. <laughs> right. It's clean here. Yeah. That and kind also, of stuff happened all were, the time. There was right. more than one occasion where, you know, the line producer of these movies has the hardest job in the universe, which is just getting the actors there yeah. when you need them and coordinating all of their different schedules and shooting other movies and there were times where we had written a scene for certain characters and we'd be told like, how would the Hulk be in there? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, give me a minute. Right. And, That's right. you know, a lot of the time you could, it, it's not to say the characters are interchangeable, but you can do a different angle on the scene with a different character in it if you have them available. Right. Um, and there were some just really unusual things where you'd shoot half a scene a dialogue scene of two people with somebody right. who looked an awful lot no, like Benedict it, Cumberbatch. That's right. I see. And then, <laughs> it's like we're doing this with John it. Oliver. Right. <laughs> and then you come in. Feel free to there. drop him that's in right. for the, in post. I'm sure he would be much livelier. That's yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, I mean, among the many challenges that you face uh, is the fact that between Infinity War and Endgame, there are there's. Still going to be Black Panther. There's going to be uh, Black Panther's book oh, was like two immediately. Months okay, right. That's right. its own different story. So right, that hasn't. Yeah. Right, the audience hasn't seen that yet. But there are going to yeah. be characters from Black Panther yeah. in these films. Yeah. Then we're going to get Ant Man and the Wasp, and then we're going to get uh, Captain Marvel. Right. So uh, she hasn't even been sort of introduced to continuity, and and you're writing whole scenes for right. her. I yeah. Mean, how? Oh, and she's acting. Keep. The, I mean, yeah. do the math here, right? Yeah. So if you've seen Captain Marvel, you know it's a. It's a 90s movie, mm -hmm. but Brie Larson has to shoot our movie first, which takes place 20 years later. Mm -hmm. So she has to pretend to be a person who has had, who's 20 years removed from a movie she has not shot and has <laughs> kind of not written yet, yeah. <laughs> right? So we have to write a character and then go to the directors, Anna and Ryan, and right. say, oh. okay, this person 20 years later, is this hypothetically the type of person she could become in your, after your hypothetical movie? Right. <laughs> and they went, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and we, for both, Ant-Man and the Wasp and Captain Marvel, we wrote the tags, right. okay. which tie both of those movies back into the sort of infinity saga. Which, right. we can, which was an advantage, actually, yeah. for sure. Like, we used that, you know, when someone tells you, so you're gonna write the 19th movie and the 22nd movie. <laughs> okay, uh, so we, it, that's the kind of thing where we have to talk to the filmmakers and say, please don't kill this person, we might use them, that kind of thing. Uh, but it was an advantage. We sort of looked at it as you know, there, another eight, 10 minutes of movie that we yeah. could use and just assume or hope or I don't even know if I care that it's out there and you gotta watch it. Yeah. You know? And I mean, everybody's pretty amenable I and mean, nobody's. Yeah, really... there's not, nobody's real precious about it. Yeah, no, that. yeah. that's one thing about Marvel, it is very much a collaborative company as a whole. Yeah. And if you, if you, if you do fail to collaborate, you probably don't have the longest career. Right. Well, heard. it's it's also it's a it's a relay race that's been running for eleven years. You yeah. do not want to be the one that right. drops the baton. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, uh, again, you know, without getting into sort of you know spoiler uh, territory, but I, I mean, I think it's safe to say. I mean, the first act of Endgame. I mean, just the mood of it. There's a lot of. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, somber, somber yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of people, you know, still wrestling with uh, grief and loss. And that, at least to me, I mean, that's a very unusual uh, emotion and tone to see in a movie of this uh, scale. Yeah. Uh, it's just, you know, we don't necessarily think of that as being part of the kind of the blockbuster uh, film. Right. But I think, you, right. I mean, it totally lands. It's it's uh, it, it sets the stage. Yeah. It, well, it felt very necessary. You know, if you're gonna make 22 movies about more or less the same squad of characters, taking some out, putting some in, they have to develop, and it can't all be good. Right. And we, you know, we all in our lives take some pretty big hits that take some time to recover from. And what makes these characters relatable and maybe differentiates them from some of the other things 
is that the movies are all about the people inside the costumes. There's not, it's not really about Iron Man. It's about Tony Stark. It's about Steve Rogers. Um, and you have to put them through some shit. Yeah. Uh, and when you put them through what we put them through in Infinity War, to clean that up too quickly would invalidate the point of doing the project in the first place. Yeah. So we all wanted to sort of wallow in, in yeah. the misery for a while and yeah. see how it affected them and how it changed them. Uh, and that was, I mean, it, it was a lot of fun right. in a perverse kind of way. Yeah. Marvel has, I think Marvel has earned the right to do that. They've certainly earned the ability to risk that, right? Because you're, you're probably going. You're going to go to that movie after the snap. You may not go four times, but you're going to go because you know, you've, you've been to the other ones and, and, and there's this anticipation. So, I mean, we've sort of joked that the movies we've done with Joan Anthony are the broccoli movies. You know, <laughs> and that Thor Ragnarok and the Guardians get right. to be candy and we're, the, we're your vegetables, right? right? But it, <laughs> so we sort of... But you'll it. die if you only <laughs> eat candy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, we, we've got some questions on note cards from audience members, but I guess before I start asking them, I mean, I just, uh, I think it bears asking. I mean, you know, there was so much talked about before Endgame Open just about uh, the running time of yeah. it. And that, you know, again, is sort of an unprecedented thing yeah. to have a three hour movie, in, again, in this sort of category. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say I thought that the movie, uh, you know, completely earned that. I wish it was even longer. Maybe not everyone would feel that way, but I could have lived in there for a long time. Was we there have some footage for you. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> was that ever a point of contention just in the course of making the film that, that once it became clear it would need to be this long, that were, were people starting to get a little nervous about that? Uh, not, not that I saw. I mean, everyone was pretty much in agreement that if you take on this project and you're going to try and tie up 21 preceding movies, yeah. If you get that done in 90 minutes, you have screwed up. Yeah. You know, this, <laughs> right. this requires right. respect and to honor everything that came before in order to bring them to an organic conclusion so that when you do do things like we do at the end of this movie, which I'm not going to tell you people out there in the dark. They know. Uh, <laughs> it feels right and earned and not abrupt or you know, like we needed to get to the ending. Yeah. Um, Probably spent half a morning talking about whether or not we should split it, you know? Like, is it, a, is it three movies? Oh. Yeah, not terribly seriously. We always, yeah, it would you know, be where like would you split it? One like, great movie or two. Like, that's the thing. Like, one of them would have sucked. Yeah. yeah. So we, we a chose, movie and then a DVD that we hand yeah, you. At yeah, exactly. Like that. Yeah. Here's more fighting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah so... So uh, this question comes from uh, an audience member named Josh, and he asks, uh, what challenges did you face when writing superhuman characters and trying to make them feel grounded and vulnerable? Uh, well, you have to find their weak spots. I mean, the Hulk's vulnerability is not that he's, you know, you can't punch him, but he's got all sorts of flaws and and they all do, and that's the legacy of Stan Lee and, right. and the classic Marvel comics. Is, yeah. And what differentiated that from the other comics that were around at the time was they are a neurotic bunch yeah. of people with, <laughs> whose superhero abilities are really getting in the way of living a normal right. life. Yeah. Right. Uh, and in, are impacting them in negative ways. Yeah. And, you know, you have to take that and run with that and make sure you're never forgetting that Steve Rogers would like to have a life, yeah. right. but his sense of duty never lets him. You'd like, you know, you remember in some sense or another that Tony Stark used to be an asshole, yeah. you know, <laughs> and maybe an alcoholic and is, is working on that right. and that the Hulk is, you know, all screwed up yeah. and right. Peter Parker... Black Widow has a dark past. Yeah. You know? yeah, like it's all, it's a bunch of very screwed up people that you're watching. Yeah, um, yeah we often say we don't, like our slug lines don't say Black Widow or Captain America, they say Natasha and Steve. And so we, we definitely don't write for the costume, we write for the people inside. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you were talking about Stan Lee, and there's a question from an audience member uh, who asks, you know, did you guys ever speak with Stan? And uh, if so, what was it like working with the man who helped create the Marvel Universe? Right. 
Uh, we met him twice uh, for his two cameos. That, well, three, uh, actually. Uh, well, well, there's one in Endgame and there's no, one. No, no, I know. I don't remember. I don't think I was there for the bus day. Uh, yeah, right. I might have been. Might have. Um, so uh, we, we were there for Tony Stank. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, greatest thing, I have to say, this is I love Stan. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Stan knows Robert, Robert, or knew Robert yeah. Downey Jr. as Robert. Yeah. And he kept going up and going, is Robert, St I have a package for Robert Stank. <laughs> <laughs> Stan, Stan, Stan. <laughs> Tony. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have a picture in our office of us with Stan, and then his last uh, last cameo in Endgame was pretty was pretty special. Yeah. And so, but I mean, this is a guy whose voice I've been hearing, you know, in weird voiceovers on cartoons yeah. my whole life. I've been reading the little, yeah. you know, letter column in the comics. Sure. It's. It, it is, I've said this before, it's like having Santa Claus show yeah. up. It's you're like, you don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> it was always a delight when he was on set. Because yeah. everyone came out of the woodwork. Suddenly the, the crew swelled. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this question comes from uh, an audience member named Annabella, and she asks, uh, do you think there is a need in today's society for a superhero to save us from ourselves? Oh, you're going to ask me to get political, Annabelle. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, my God, yes. Sure. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, I think we should not wait for superheroes. We should look to ourselves. Yes. <laughs> the pitchforks are available. <laughs> What do you think it is, though, that, uh, you know, obviously, you know, superheroes are, you know, kind of the coin of the realm right now in, yeah. in storytelling. I mean, they're, and and they're, it's not just because they're lively and the stories are, are great, but, I mean, there's, they're fulfilling some kind of need yeah. in us. And they're, they're speaking to something in, in the, a decade's worth or more of, of our lives. So it's not, it's not just this moment. It's something broader, don't you think? Yeah. Well, one, I mean... There's a, there is an innate human love of serialized storytelling where when you start connecting things together, some part of the brain fires. Like, and I've seen it with, with my little daughter, and I've seen it with myself. And if you go, that's the guy from over there. Yeah. <laughs> something happens in your head, and it's like joy. Yeah. And I don't really understand it. Um, Social media exacerbates that, right? yeah. you know, so that we now talk about that joy ad nauseum, you know. I also think we live in a really disordered time. Yeah. And to see people willing to do what it takes to put things back in order is reassuring and hopefully maybe even inspiring. Yeah. I mean, that's why Captain America was invented in the first place, yeah. to get people off their ass. Right. And, you know, he punches Adolf Hitler. Right. On the Nine floor. months before Pearl Harbor. Right. Before we were in the war. Yeah. To get people to go, there's a problem. Yeah. Right. And maybe this is the sort of person, and I don't mean a super person, but someone like 90 pound Steve Rogers who has the willingness to stand up and go, just cut it out. Right. Uh, don't like bullies wherever they're from. Yeah. And that still holds true. Yeah. Well, and... Uh, do what Steve would do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're talking about serialized storytelling, and you know, we've talked about this a little bit before. But there is a very popular TV series right now that just I hadn't heard. Yeah. <laughs> 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 One episode was just about people preparing yes. for right. you know a life-altering battle, mm -hmm. then followed by the battle. Uh, yes, I could barely see it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you turn the lights off in the No, room? I saw it. I, it was on my you know, I'm beginning to think it's not a game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 there's nothing fun about it. That's, yeah. that's right. Why, they're not we, By the way, we've looked at that show a lot. Yeah, uh, Because it's really impressive. Uh, um, uh, and we, the idea that the, all these uh, main characters can be separate for so long. Yeah and then eventually weave together and you still know what you're watching and you still yeah. feel it's all part of the same thing. We absolutely leaned on that in Infinity War in terms of how long you can yeah. keep these people apart. And as an example of audience tolerance also, because I do think that the audience is 
getting, I don't, I don't think they're getting more accepting of complicated storytelling. I think the people who tell stories are beginning to realize how complicated a yeah. story you can tell to the quote unquote average person yeah. and how much they'll like and it. And that's because we're not dependent on advertising based television as much anymore. And it's mm -hmm. not, you know, people in suits saying you gotta sell Palm Olive and so don't don't right. make it too complicated. You know, they pay their thirteen dollars a month. You can make it as complicated as you want. Yeah. yeah. And they and they like they're not us. Right. We <laughs> will like it because the human brain really can grasp yeah. some pretty complicated stuff. Yeah. And not to say that, you know, we're telling the most complicated stuff, <laughs> but it's, it is, you know, go ahead and, and get crazy, you yeah. know. No, there is some abstract stuff that you guys yeah. deal with. I mean, again, mm. not to spoil it, uh, but, uh, you know, it's stuff that, you know, on paper somebody might say, you know, that's, that's too weird. That's mm. going to alienate yeah. somebody yep. in some movie theater somewhere, so it would be easier just not to have the weirdness, but doesn't yeah. it feel like, in a way, the weirder it gets, the more it draws people and the bigger an audience it can speak to? It, well, I've, genre, I've said before, yeah. and I'll say it again. Uh, they weren't <laughs> listening before. No, they weren't even <laughs> here. I was alone in the theater. Uh, genre is just a delivery system for story. Right. You know, it is something to get you comfortable and to get you interested and to then hopefully slip a little something in underneath the detective solving the crime yeah. or the cowboy riding into the sunset. Yeah. You know, and if you're just doing a genre and you're not doing that, right. you're not using all the potential it has. Yeah. But to judge a genre more harshly because it has people in, in funny outfits rather than, you know, rugged seafaring wear in a right. seaport town. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, is to just, you know, it's, you know, simpler doesn't always mean better, yeah. you know, grayer doesn't always mean better. Yeah. And if you engage the audience, they are then available to take in right. many things, yeah. you know. And if you just plop those things in front of them without the engagement, they're probably not going to get it. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean they're not going to understand it. I mean, they're not going to come in and yeah. get it. Yeah. Like, so once you've got the door open, right. you know. Why not give them quality? Yeah. Quality's nice. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, you know, figure out uh, the safest way to answer this, but what was the most fun scene to write in Endgame? Uh, there are... I won't say what they are, but there are some character transformations. Yeah, that's There's pretty fun. Where people, uh, we get to see what everyone has been through and what it has put them through. <laughs> um, and across the board, even the sad ones, they were very fun to write because it was, they were all out of their superhero comfort zone right. and they were people. Um, screwed up people yeah. and that was great and some of them were more fun than others in terms of being more blatantly uh, comic but and there's been some backlash about at least one of the comic things which is comic but only only, only so far as it goes is actually very sad and we're not this is an impossible conversation to have without saying it. You brought it up. I know. <laughs> I will just say in our, you know, very, very vague defense, uh, we don't fix that problem at the end because that's not the problem. Right. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Should, what is, you know, I think it's uh, screening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, without spoiling anything, I mean, the, you know, the movie ends uh, with the potential for certain people's stories to still continue. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, are you in any way involved in, in are you going to help further those stories or is this? Not as of yet, no. We uh, 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 have, have taken a, a, a break from the Marvel Universe. They have not called us specifically for something. Uh, and well, they actually have. And that's the. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> but we, uh, uh, and I think that's probably healthy for us and healthy for them. Like they yeah. should really get some fresh blood in there. Um, uh, we're a couple of tired old mules, you know. Oh. Uh, but we started a studio with the Russo brothers, and yeah. that's doing a lot. That's that's occupying a lot of our time, and so we're uh, we're executive producing a number of sort of the bigger projects there, and we've written at least we wrote one thing already, and we're going to write another one this year, and so. Which isn't to say we won't go back. No, we'd like when to go the back. batteries are recharged and the yeah the. You know, we can't get bigger. We can't write a bigger Marvel movie with yeah, more I mean, people in it. So, right. <laughs> you know, we got to kind of go back and find one character and yeah. see what we can do with that. Right. Right. I think I think we have time for one more question. It's a little bit spoilery. It's, I mean, it's just uh, you have a lot of them there, Dave. You don't yeah. have to pick that one. Uh, no, it's a good, it's a good one though. And and you know, it, uh, if it, it's not going to. And it's the it. last one. So what are they going to do? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll be halfway out the door. <laughs> What was the inspiration for I Love You 3000? Ah. Robert. That is... So the line went, uh, I love you tons, I love you tons. And so he says I love you tons, but his children say to him, I love you 3000. Oh. In real life. In real life, yeah. So, yeah. so we allowed him. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what are we going to do? I don't want to make this all about me, but I have a four-year-old son, and he, I mean, he hasn't seen the film. I don't uh -huh. think he could make it three hours, but he, he says to me, I love you kazillion. And so uh, when aww. I heard that, I mean, I was blubbering away. Ah. I, I love the idea of David Scott blubbering away in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> it gets me right here. I'm a soft touch, what can I say? <laughs> we, we, I believe we're out of time. It's 8.30, but I just want to say uh, thank you and congratulations to Christopher Marcus, Stephen McFeely. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you.